and here we are my first um, video about EZD6 and I thought the first thing to tackle would be magic that uh, seems to be the thing that people want a little more guidance on uh, the rest of the rules are so simple and straightforward but let me tell you a little bit about magic and why it is the way it is first off when I was building the game I was doing different play testing and I was doing things where you would have spells that you just rolled randomly to get and people weren't thrilled with that it did avoid the whole issue that I find that is a big problem in games is all the accounting that takes place when you're a spellcaster, right? And all the decision, the painful decision. You got to choose all these different spells and you got you to keep track of the, you know, your spell points or your, your spell slots or whatever. I didn't want any of that. I wanted so that a conjurer, which is the magic user in this game, could be ready to play at the same time as a warrior, right? If you make a conjurer or you make a warrior, you're going to complete your character creation about the same time because it's that easy. You don't have to agonize over all this stuff that you normally do as a spellcaster. Now, talking about the system for rolling, that wasn't, people weren't thrilled about that. So I'm like, what can I do? And I'm like, okay, what do I like about magic? And here's what I like. I like the unpredictability, which is fun, the rolling for magic. I like the fact that um, a player can sacrifice to make something happen. Uh, and I think that's really a cool factor of the system. Um, so I want to get all those kind of unpredictability, player choice, um, and that kind of thing into the game uh, when I made the magic system. So that's when I came up with the resistance versus the power level of the players. So let me give you a quick rundown how it works. So what happens is a conjurer, which is the magic user, tells you their spell they want to cast, okay? And you're in a specific circle of magic. So say the easiest thing you could possibly say is say you're a fire elementalist, right? And you just want to blast one target with a fire blast. Okay, easy enough. So that's really easy to figure out. Most targets have 1d6 resistance. So the rabble rouser, game master, rolls a d6, and whatever number they get, the conjurer has to beat it or equal it on three dice. Okay, say I roll a two on a d6, which is really easy to beat. So the conjurer may want to just roll out of the three dice. They may just want to roll one die because the only, the only way they're not going to beat it is if they roll the one and fail the spell anyway, right? So they, you know, they, they, want to do, they might want to do that. Now, if I roll a five, you might want to roll two or three dice. And I'll explain why that's risky. Okay, that's risky because if you roll any ones in that power level roll, the spell automatically fails. Okay, but there is a caveat. There's a several caveats. One is, if one of your power level dice equals or beats the resistance of the Rebel Rouser roll, you could cast a spell, but the one is stopping you from doing it, right? Well, as a conjurer, you can take spell burn and eat that one and then your spell successfully cast. But you take a strike of damage uh, for each one you eat. So when you only got three strikes and you're dead, <laughs> taking one of those strikes away is very, very dangerous. Or if, if you cast, if you roll, you could even roll two ones and a six on your spell roll and beat the, beat the resistance, but then you gotta eat two ones, right? So, you know, that's very dangerous. Then you only got one strike left, so. I like that risk uh, factor, and I like giving the player the choice to do it or not, right? Oh, darn it, that's a failure, but nah, I, I think I'll eat it. I think I'll, I'll take the spell burn, right? And Because I, I really want to cast this. Now, um, I have a mechanic, a meta mechanic called karma in the game, which can add, for one karma, you trade it for one pip on the dice, and that bumps it up one, one point. So if you roll a four, you spend one karma, <clears throat> you get a five, okay? So easy as that. But with magic and miracles, which are another, a similar system with the divine powers, you can't use karma because the gods are so aloof for one, magic is so, un the winds of magic are so unpredictable that karma cannot be used to modify that, okay? So I like that, I like that uh, mechanic. But you do have one recourse. And that recourse is to roll your hero die. You get karma and one hero die at the start of the session. You can roll a hero die to re-roll anything, including a one. You can't use karma on any ones, but you can use your hero die to re-roll a one. 
If you get another one, tough luck. <laughs> you, you got it, but but you did, um, you know, use that. Now, during play testing, uh, I found out that that uh, conjurers tended to use less karma than other characters, because really the currency of a of a conjurer is their spells, and you can't use karma on spells, so they'll be used on saving throws and stuff like that, or other actions. But mostly, a conjurer is doing spells. So what I did was I had that you, if you can spend, you can spend five karma to get your hero dice back, because the hero die is great for conjurers, right? Because you can reroll that one, you can reroll that one in a spell roll, or if you really want to cast that spell and you reroll it, uh, you might get it. Now I've had games that were just like on the edge of your seat crazy uh like there was a finale of one game i was running and my wife was playing uh a character and she to help everyone they realized that the the way the boss had set up the encounter was that one of them was going to have to sacrifice themselves right so uh my wife took my wife's character took that role and my my daughter's like oh hell no so she's like okay i'm gonna cast a spell do this you know try to save her and she just totally flubs the spell roll. She just totally screws it up. She's like, okay, I got my hero die. I'm gonna roll, roll that hero die and see if I get it. And she rolls it and it's like, no, he didn't make it. So she, you know, she had to make that, my wife had to make that heroic sacrifice, but m my daughter was trying, or she was trying to, trying to make it work. And uh, just on the edge, everybody's on the edge of their seat. Like the die is like, you know, it's like when the die spins for five minutes and you're like waiting for it to like stop. It was just like, every, the excitement at the table was just electric. Uh, so that's that's one thing I love about this system. I love that you you know and uh, you know magic users don't become useless. You don't use all your good spells, right? You can cast as many spells as you want. It just depends on your spell roll. So that that tames it back a bit. Now let's talk about spells that aren't just a simple kind of fire and forget spell like a firebolt, right? That's easy because you roll the resistance to the target, you roll the hit. If you do, they take a strike. And the, if you're a fire elementalist, they're on fire. They're caught on fire, right? So, okay. Now, um, one thing that's not clear in the rules is magic can only do one strike of damage. You can't really crit with magic. But if you wanted to play the crit with magic, it would be okay. Because it's much harder to get a crit with magic than it is with normal attacks. Because when you're fighting with normal attacks, you can use karma to boost your rolls and keep getting sixes, right? And keep re-rolling that one die and getting and getting hits with magic you can't use karma so it's much harder to get that six so i would be okay if you if you did want to do that i generally play where, you, where magic can only do one strike i find that kind of evens out the ability of like a magic user to target six targets where you know a normal a normal fighter is only targeting one so that that kind of evens it out now also the risk of uh targeting more targets is interesting because uh, you know, in, in a lot of games where you cast a fireball, it just hits however many targets are in the template, right, or in the area. Where this game, you have to choose how many targets are in the near area, and then that gives extra resistance to all the targets. So it's either all or none. Like if you're casting essentially a fireball, you're that fire elementalist casting a fireball, you're trying to hit all the targets, you're trying to hit six targets, which is the maximum. You, you can only still roll up to three power die, but the, the Rabble Rouser rolls six resistance die because of one D6 for each target. And if there's any target that has more magic resistance, that's even more dice in the pool. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind because if you fail that spell roll, you don't hit any of the targets. You don't hit one target. So that's, the, that's fun with the risk and reward. You know, you can get a lot, but you're risking a lot also. So maybe I'll just cut it back to three targets. You know, maybe not. I won't do six. So that's that's another fun decision. Uh, now, I'll well, talk about a little bit about miracles for a minute. Um, miracles are very similar to magic, except you're petitioning. And, and in the game, everybody can get the devout inclination, which makes you be able to call on miracles. So any character, you don't have to be a cleric or anything. You can get the devout. But miracles are very hard. Okay, so um, for example, if you wanted to resurrect someone, I would roll 66 dice to do that, okay? Or if you're of the mind you don't want resurrection in your game, don't allow resurrection. The, they, they're dead, dead is dead. You can't, you can't be resurrected by, uh, by miracles. Also, miracles can't hurt or damage. So that's a bit, that takes that attack kind of thing out of miracles. Um, it just adds the benefit of the utility of miracles, right? 
to maybe speak with the dead, or you could even turn, you could even turn, you know, undead and stuff like that, which I would do 66 for that. Um, so keep that in mind when you're doing miracles. Now, miracles don't have spell burn, so you can't take, if you roll any ones in a miracle roll, the miracle's over. You can't, you can't, but your petition is not accepted. Um, but there is a little recourse you have, which is kind of a fun role-playing element. It's called offerings. And offerings, a, a devout character can do an offering to their god once a day, okay? Probably I would do it at the beginning of the day, right? Because then if you need to re-roll. So if you've done an offering to your god, you can re-roll all your miracle, uh, your prayer dice, which are the equivalent of power level dice for a conjurer. You can re-roll, you can, you, you don't, you don't, you can't, you choose, you have to re-roll all those dice, right? So if you rolled three dice in the first check, you have to re-roll all three, okay? But you get a second chance. You may get that, you may petition that miracle because you made the offering. So it's a fun role-playing element, but it also adds a nice game benefit to that player also. So those are kind of uh, the basics of magic. But I, I want to talk about more a, a more complex spell, right? So say you're a necromancer, okay? And you wanted to, you found a pile of skeletons, which is pretty cool. So the necromancer is like, oh, could I like raise this pile of skeletons into like an ended conglomeration, like a golem, like a, like a bone golem, right? And as a rabble rouser, I'd say, yeah, that fits, right? You're a necromancer. These are dead. Uh, why not? So what I, what I, how I would think about it is I would think about this. I would think about, okay, I think I'll give it about ogre stats, which is three strikes. So um, I'll make that 3d6 resistance, okay? Because the spirits of the dead and all this stuff, um, and I'll give it two. I'll give it two uh, two attacks with a two fists or whatever. Um, and as long as and it can st and it's it's kind of a permanent spell, right? So the the thing could stay with the necromancer until it's dismissed. Okay, you could do that, or you could say, well, with spell anchoring in the game where you have to anchor a spell in your mind that's a continuing spell, you could say when the Necromancer loses, you know, falls asleep, loses consciousness. The thing just falls apart. Or if you want to be generous, you could say, well, you can continue to have this thing as long as you don't cast. But once you cast another spell, the thing goes away, right? So that's the caveat. But anyways, I think that's how I would handle like if you wanted to raise that undead conglomeration. People might say, well, if you can just roll, why not just keep rolling, right? Some situations like this, you may not want them to re-roll, right? So you could say, oh, the bones were pulverized. Uh, when, you, when you attempted binding them together, all the bones were pulverized and exploded into powder, and now it's useless. Or maybe the spirits of the dead are blocking you, and they don't, they won't, they don't want you to use their bodies in this way. So use a story thing to keep a player from re-rolling. If, if it's awkward that you don't want them to re-roll, um, you know, that's fine. But in a situation where, say, a botanicalist is trying to grow a vine up a cliff uh, to get away. In that situation, I would let them keep re-rolling because it's like the enemy's like coming at them. The you know the warriors and fighters are trying to hide the you know hold them off while the botanicalist you know grows this vine up a cliff, and you know that would be fun. That that's a fun use of the re-roll. Just to re-roll to until you get it is not a fun use of the re-roll. So don't allow players to just keep re-rolling. If it's something like that, right? If it's if it's something action and fun, allow them to keep re-rolling, right? But if it's not, you know, take that take that element out. Uh, now the uh, one thing I had in a game which was just super cool, right? Is what I love about this system. Players coming up with their with spells that fit the situation, right? Not spells that oh, let me look through my book. And I gotta find uh, okay, what spell fits this situation? Uh, yeah, this one. Okay, what's it do? Blah 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 blah. All this rigmarole, pff, throw that away, right? Just flush that down the toilet. Because in Easy D6, your players are gonna come up with stuff that affects what's happening in the game now, not because oh, some option I have in a list, right? Let me give you a great example of this that blew me away. So we were playing a game that was like this haunted monastery, okay? And the monastery, the players were trying to figure out what was going on, right? It was, this, it was, it was obviously cursed. Something is awful happened here. Uh, there's mutated creatures and all this stuff. 
and they keep seeing like these spirits or shadows like talking about something that they they're only getting bits and pieces of the information right uh and it's it's very much like um the shining you know in the hotel with all the weird ghosts and everything but the shadow caster uh asked me this he's like oh could i use my powers to like a vcr kind of rewind the sha- the shades and the shadows and like see the whole conversation and I, you know i'm thinking in my mind that is badass. That is such a cool use. Now, you could, you could argue, well, that's not quite shadow magic or whatever, but it's close enough. Why not? I mean, it's just so, such a cool idea. So, yeah, I let him do it. I didn't even have him roll because I just let him do it because he wasn't under duress. They weren't being attacked or anything. He had plenty of time to cast the spell. So, you know, in that kind of case, I'll just let a player do, cast the spell. It's not... It's not attacking anybody. It's not hurting anybody. It's not a permanent benefit. Just let them cast a spell, right? And I did. And so they were able to get all this great information about what was going on here. And so what it was was these philosophers and sages had come together and were trying to decide. They were going to do a ritual to sever the gods' ties to the world. And they were trying to decide, okay, for the free will of people, should we do this? And they decided to, and... It didn't go well, right? <laughs> so that's why this place is cursed. But, you know, that gave them all that great information because when players have information in the game, the game is that much more fun because they know what's going on. They may not know everything that's going on, but they understand what's, and they have a much deeper meaning of what's going on. If you, if you, you know, if, if players keep failing lore checks, it's like the game is not as fun because they don't know what's going on. So I always do say, I always use a rule that's kind of like I call due diligence, that if a player takes the time to, to try to learn something, they'll learn the basic information. Like other information uh, that could really help the players might be hidden behind a check, but always give them the basic information. And this was a great way to get that across. And he, it was a badass moment in the game. Like he was... He was so, you know, he felt so great that he was able to do this. And one of the other players, immediate, a warrior player, immediately said, I want to play a conjurer next time <laughs> in the play test. So that tells you right there that all the players just thought this was a badass moment in the game. And that, that was so much fun. So that's one thing I love about this system. It gives you those moments in the game where you can... Uh, you know, come up with your own spells that fit the situation, not you have a list of spells that you're trying to fit to the situation or that you have to keep bookkeeping or, you know, you run out of resource and you can't do it. You're suddenly a, a wizard or whatever that can't do anything. You're a magic user that can't do anything or you have just lame spells left. You never, ever run into that problem in this game. And, you know, that's, that's fun. So uh, I hope this answers some questions uh, about the magic system because I think some people might have a hard time um, arbitrating this. But if you just use the, the rules of the book, that goes a long way to, you know, helping you. So like say, say that same necromancer like says, I want to cast death spell on this and kill it. Um, well, you know, since I was saying that magic really only does one strike, you can't do that, right? If, so, if someone has one strike, it, it would kill them. But you can't, like, take... If someone has 25 strikes, you can't kill it with one death spell, right? Because they don't... It doesn't do that many strikes. So if you just use the rules in the book, rolling you know, rolling resistance, roll high, roll, roll a lot of dice if the player wants something, you know, really good. Don't have them roll if it, if it fits those situations that I said about the shadow caster. Um, you know... Uh, allow them to re-roll if it's exciting, you know, and, they, and, they, and they're trying to get away or try to escape or something. So use those rules that are in the book uh, to help you. And those will arbitrate most of, the, most of the things that happen, right? But with the death spell, you could say, oh, yeah, you could, you could, you could use the death spell, uh, but it only, does one, it only one, does one strike, right, if you hit. So, uh, and magic kind of does an extra benefit. So think of it that way. So the death spell might, you could say, oh, if you wanted to be like a vampiric, attack, right? So it could maybe give somebody a strike back. You know what I'm saying? Like steal a strike from the person. I would allow that because that fits within it. 
and that's kind of cool. But um, because all the mat, that's the benefit of magic. Even though it only does one strike, if you're a fire elementalist, you're on fire. Uh, you know, if if you're if it's your earth elementalist, the per, the target slowed. You know, those kind of things. So um, if you're a water elementalist, the target's slippery and fall over and stuff. So uh, you know, those kind of things. That added benefit that you get. Uh, override the, the ability to do a lot of strikes, right? Because you can't. Um, now, also, I love the fact that there's a Blastmaster in the game, right? Now, if you just want to blow crap up, <laughs> right? Blastmasters do two strikes on every hit, so those are fun. They also, if somebody tries to hit the Blastmaster and they roll a one, they get a strike of damage because energy is literally, like, coursing through them, right? It's sparking off of them, and they're just kind of drunk. I, I imagine they're just kind of drunk with magic, right? Um, so, you know, that's fun. But, uh, yeah, I hope that helps with some of the arbitration. If you guys have any questions about the magic, you know, you can get on my Discord or uh, ask the questions here. I will answer any questions here about magic or anything about the game. And uh, it's already a gold seller on Drive Through RPG. Uh, people are getting it. They love it. They, they want to get rid of all these rules and have a game that, you know, moves moves at lightning speed, is easy for everyone to play, gets out of the way of the story. I would say enhances the story because it's not blocking the story by what I call rules breaks, when you have to keep looking up rules or even look it on your sheet. Once you know your character, which is really easy to learn, you don't have to even look at your sheet. You, 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 know, that, you can't say that for many games that you don't have to look at your sheet. Uh, but this is one of those games and it makes, the, it makes the, the whole table move at lightning speed. Everybody just gets excited. The, the energy ramps up. I love uh, what I've seen with this game. So, um, yeah, I hope that helps on Magic. And don't be afraid of it. Um, just take a few moments to think about it when a player, you know, uh, pitches you their spell. And, uh, you know, come back and say, okay, how, many, how much resistance am I going to roll? You know, and this kind of thing. And, you know, if you have to bargain with the player, don't be afraid. Well... Okay, that's, you know, that may be too powerful, but you could do this. You know, that, that kind of thing. And then they could even change up the spell if they wanted. So, uh, yeah, I hope this helps. You guys take care. And I'll see you next time on uh, talking about some more rules about EZD6. All right.